All right. And I'll go ahead and share my screen and we'll go ahead and get started on our actual lesson today. So um, like I mentioned earlier, is that our lesson is going to be involving, um, our lecture is going to be involving um, Python. And so uh, I think if I remember this right, this is going to be like really your first uh, lecture that's specifically gauged towards Python, which is a uh, is basically a programming language that we're going to be used extensively throughout um, data science. Um, there's some other programming languages. Um, if anyone's familiar with R, I think uh, Greg had mentioned a couple people might have uh, know the R programming language um, that can also be used for data science. But I will tell you is that over the past couple of years, it has definitely moved more and more towards Python, um, though there are plenty of data scientists who still use R. But um, if you don't know any programming languages or, you know, programming languages is like maybe I've done it at some point, but feel a little rusty. Um, I think you'll find Python uh, relatively um, relatively easy to pick up. Um, you know, it does take a little bit of a learning curve, and there's some nuances and such. Um, but I will say, is that a programming language? I do think it's relatively easy to pick up of whatever skill level you have. Okay. So uh, I kind of make a little joke here. It's like Python. You don't need to be scared of snake, uh, afraid of snakes. Um, it is definitely manageable. Um, overall objectives that we're planning to do today, um, hopefully by the time we finish today's lecture, um, you will feel relatively comfortable, maybe not a master at these skills, but relatively comfortable of doing things like distinguishing and using objects of different data types. So understanding what a data type is and what that involves and what kind of things you can do with certain data types. Um, using if and else statements, basically what we call conditionals, uh, more control flow and then slice it, slice into strings, lists, and tuples. We might not talk about tuples today. We'll see if we'll get to this. Um, definitely strings and lists, uh, talk about slicing. And then um, lastly is constructing a for loop. Um, and basically that's kind of um, a big thing for iteration to basically repeat processes over and over again. Um, one thing I'll kind of emphasize is the reason why programming is so useful is in a lot of ways you try to make it as simple and um, short as possible so you don't have to keep rewriting the same stuff the same processes over and over again so you'll see this in for loops you'll see this in functions um you'll see this common basically so you don't have to keep repeating yourself over and over again and that's kind of the overall goal of really programming okay so um like i've already mentioned um earlier but it's worth reminding if you have any questions at all feel free to um you just kind of chime in um, if you want to just put it on the chat too, I'll try to keep my eye open on the chat, but I can't make a promise that I'll see it right away. Um, I, I try, but usually I'll, I kind of lose track. Um, I usually look at everyone's faces as much best I can, um, but um, the best thing to do is like, if you have a really uh, pressing question, just go ahead and unmute yourself and um, go ahead and say, oh, I have a question. Okay. So let's talk about those Python fundamentals. So you might have already seen a little bit of Python before, some kind of programming language. Um, there's a classic for programming is that we can basically do calculations, do arithmetic. Um, and you can see here, for example, 2 plus 2. Note that this time, this um, star, the asterisk, is a uh, multiplication. So you can see here this follows the, the rules of um, order of operations. So you can see here 2 times 10, 20 plus 2, 22. We can have very large numbers, which is very convenient. Uh, so we don't have to calculate that ourselves. Um, note that there is, to a certain point, um, a certain amount of precision that computers can have. Um, I'm sorry, did people see my screen right now? I realize. OK, cool. Someone asked if they could see my screen. Um, if you're not quite seeing it, um, you might want to check that your setting on, um, what's it called? If you have dual monitor settings, which basically makes it two separate windows, or you might have it as one window. I might have to kind of play around with sizing it. Um, but OK, good. I'm going to make sure people can see it. Um, I have done that before, for the record. I thought I shared my screen and gone through like a good like three minutes before someone said, I can't see anything. So cool. All right. Um, there's some other arithmetic, like division. You can see here, in fact, it will actually try to estimate this. Again, we have to be careful. Um, if you know anything about computers, computers count by zeros and ones in binary. So there is some kind of sometimes um, amount of precision that it can actually have. Um, you have to be very careful. So you can, But you can see here, for the most part, it can divide out with decimals, which we call floating point. Uh, we'll see a little bit of that later. We can see, like for example, this right here with this double dash dash, that is um, basically a floor division. And you can see here that actually, basically it doesn't round it, it basically just chops off any remainder. So instead of 6.75, you now see just six. So this can be very convenient when with certain operations that you want, where you want a whole number or what we call an integer. Okay. Um, this percent sign right here, 
um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with this percent. This is basically taking the modulus um, and basically modulus five. Basically, it's like division, um, but then keeping a remainder. So uh, 375 divided by five, that divides evenly, and you'll see that it has a remainder of zero. If I have something like uh, divided by th or modulus three, you see, well, actually, that divides perfectly. So that's a good example. Let's divide by four, and you can see there's a remainder of three. And if I actually did the division instead, you would see that this 93 and then there's basically 0.75 or three quarters left. So you can kind of see where that three is coming from. And again, these two ones are, you know, we typically might not do this in our normal, you know, arithmetic, um, you know, if you learn back in like grade school and stuff, but they can be very useful for controlling the flow of how a, com a program computes. So they can be very useful to understand. Okay. And I think I saw someone unmute themselves if they had a question at this point. Oh yeah, sorry, it was me. Um, I was just thinking you use double um, divide, and it just it just cuts off after the decimal. What would you what would you use if you wanted to round? Yeah, great. You wouldn't want it to go to six. You wanted to go to seven because it was six point seven five, wasn't it? That's right. Yeah. So if I wanted to say like round it in the traditional sense of rounding up or rounding down, um, you can use um, different packages, um, which are basically what we call like libraries. And so the idea there is that Python has some built-in libraries, but doesn't put that into, um, doesn't try to overload the base language with all these different little terms and stuff like that. And so in this case, you can actually import like the math library. Um, and basically that will allow you to do, you know, floor ceiling, which basically allows you to either um, floor the value or basically take the, the highest value up there, or you can do round and round will also like do a traditional rounding and such. Um, so the idea there for Python is trying to make things relatively simple and then adding on libraries and packages um, as you want more functionality. So that way you don't have this really bloated up language where you can't remember what were like the key words that you're supposed to remember. So good, great, great question. Um, but at least for the base Python stuff in Python 3, um, you only have floor division. And that's partly because it's relatively easy for the program to um, the internal logic to actually do this. So that's partly why it was implemented versus like having something like a round function. Cool. Um, all right, and then the last one here, this double asterisk basically means um, to the power. Um, so like three to the power of four. So three with the exponent of four. So that gives us 81, okay? So there's a whole bunch of different stuff, but this is kind of the classic stuff that you will use, um, some more frequently than others, um, but these are all kind of just built into Python and that way you can kind of see a little bit of how this, um, Math works. Okay. Cool. All right. So, any questions at all? Sound very good. All right. So, now that we kind of see a little bit of computation, you can see these are all kind of expressions. The next thing that we have in um, Python and can be very powerful in programming languages is variables. And variables, as you might be able to guess, are things that you can vary. Um, basically, things that you can um, kind of, I think of it almost like storing it for later. And so we talk about declaring a variable and we declare a variable basically means it's like, okay, we say this variable exists and we're going to store values in that variable. So to simply declare a variable, all you have to do essentially is have some kind of um, name where there's a naming convention and then an equal sign and 37. And that will basically declare this variable fav number with um, this value of 37. Okay, and I saw a hand go up at Christian. Yes, is this notebook available to us? Yes, I believe um, there was a shared repo repository that um, Greg had been using. Um, Y'all know what I'm talking about? Is that the, the DSC one? I think um, I have to double check the name of it to be quite honest, but uh, here we go. I'm gonna go ahead and copy it. I believe it's this one. I'm gonna share it in the chat. Unless someone has already shared it. Yes. Okay, thanks Nico. Perfect. For me, it was in the Cambridge underscore data underscore science folder, and then it would be the week three, there's a, a Jupyter notebook. So what you do, once you navigate to there, you're going to open up a Jupyter notebook and you'll see it. That's right. Yeah. So um, sorry about that. Um, if that was Thank you. Yeah, I, I haven't been able to get into that website since week one. But... Oh, okay. Um, you know what? Um, is anyone else, is everyone else able to access it? Is anyone not? You can also access it through the uh, GitHub website. 
So if you go into the, the flat iron uh, for week three, you'll have the, the fire. The only thing is you can't, uh, you know, uh, execute any commands. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll take a look. I was going to try to share it out real quick on Slack. I'm just going to put it in there. If you check out um, that Cambridge Data Science channel, if you want to download that notebook, Christian, if you're having difficult trying to get to the site, but you should be able to navigate here week three. Um, but definitely message me after a lecture and we can make sure you can get that figured out. Cool. All right. Um, cool. Great question. <laughs> I'm glad, glad you can just find where this is. So, um, all right. So going again, like in declaring variables, we can assign or we call it declaring um, our variables. And we call this right here an assignment. Basically, we assign this fave number with uh, a value 37. Okay. Uh, note that this could really be any kind of um, a set of words and letters. There's some um, conventions that you have to follow that Python requires you. Um, you can have capital letters. You can have one letter. Um, you can really sign anything as long as it's um, capital letters, lowercase letters. You can have numbers and underscores. Um, however, you have to make sure you always have um, it, number cannot be in front. So you can't do like one um, var like this. Uh, Python does not like that. However, you can have var one and that would be okay for Python. Um, and again, you can have underscores like this. And I believe you can have in front underscores like this as well. Okay. And those are the different naming conventions. So this is our assignment here. And we have a little function here called print. So this is built into Python. And this will just print out uh, whatever the value is of that um, variable here. So we can see here is that fave num equals 37. And I can print it out fave num. Um, one nice thing about Jupyter Notebooks is that the last line here is actually, if I just run this by itself, note that I don't have a print statement, it'll actually go ahead and essentially print that out to the screen here. Okay, so that's kind of a convenient thing that is special to Jupyter Notebooks. Um, one quick thing to note, however, is that this is technically not using the print function. It's actually using um, a built-in called display. And so that's actually what it's calling when you have it by itself like this at the very end. So just kind of know there's a subtle difference and you might see the difference of how it's printed out. For example, if you have what we call a string, you'll see the quotation marks when you do it like this, but you will not see quotation marks when you do it like this. Um, so just know there's a slight difference between there and just kind of know that can um, sometimes be no difference at all, like here, a subtle difference, like a quotation versus no quotations or very, very different from each other, depending on what's implemented there. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, another thing we can do with variables, we can also check what type it is. So when we actually declare a variable, uh, Python figures out, um, basically, if anyone's done any other programming languages, um, like, for example, C or C++ or Java or something like that, you typically have to specify what kind of type your variable actually is using. And in Python, Python is very, I have to call, um, very relaxed just kind of just mellow and just kind of does its own thing. And so you can really assign, for example, I have fave num here. I can put, you know, a different, um, let's say 10.1. And it's like, all right, that's fine. You can do that. Um, I can also do, we'll see in a second, strings. I can make this into basically a string. And it's like, yeah, you can do that. I don't mind. Um, and so it's very, very relaxed in that sense. But uh, we can actually check what kind of type it is saying, like, is it, you know, an integer? Is it a float? is whatever data type we're putting in here. So going back to 37, just because I had it there earlier, if I type type fave number, you can see it's an integer. If I had something like 37.1, you actually see this type now is something called a float. And those are called floating point numbers. Um, and then that other one that I showed you that will go more into detail is a string. You can see if I do this type now, we'll actually see it say type string, str. Okay. Sound pretty good? Yeah? Awesome. All right. So like I mentioned, um, one thing you can do once you declare a variable is actually do reassignment. So you can essentially just write over that variable. So in this case, I have name equals prints with, uh, I forgot about the E here. And you'll see when I actually have that printed out, you can see, oh, it's missing that E, right? So I can just go ahead and reassign this right here. Name equals prints with an E. I guess not prints, I guess I just made a small mistake in D. So if I do this now, you can see it prints out correctly. And again, 
You don't have to do anything too fancy. Uh, note, let's say, for example, I did something like 100. Again, it doesn't matter. It's like, oh, okay, you did 100. Like, oh, like it's now technically a type of integer. We can still go ahead and reassign it um, to a different value that's a different type. Okay. So I just point that out because if you are familiar with other programming languages, other programming languages might not necessarily allow you to do that, um, depending on you know what it looks like. Cool. All right. So one quick note about variables, and this is um, a little technical, but I think it's worth explaining. Uh, sometimes you'll hear variables talk about like buckets. And in most programming languages, it's very much like a bucket where you put a value inside your bucket. So you can imagine this bucket being the variable and you put like the number 37 inside there. Um, I will tell you that technically speaking, Python does not treat variables in the same way other programming languages would treat variables. Um, if you are familiar with some other programming languages, it actually uses something called a pointer. And the best analogy I've ever heard is basically thinking of it like an octopus. Um, Python's kind of like this octopus that grabs onto values with its arm. And so the arm itself is the variable. And essentially it's like, okay, it's grabbing the number 37. And this is, oh, you reassign it to 100. It let goes, it is arm lets go of 37 and grabs 100. And so instead of putting values on it, it's more that um, the, the Python internals are basically saying, oh, I'm grabbing onto it or I'm pointing to, that's the value I'm going to talk about when I say, you know, fave number or whatever it is your variable is. Um, that might not seem like a huge difference and it might effectively seem very similar, um, but you'll see uh, as you get more and more advanced Python, you'll see that kind of difference come out. Um, and David asked, is it more like the pointer in C++ sense? And it, that's exactly right. Um, it's just like a C++ pointer. In fact, Python actually is um, built on top of C. So it's actually using the C programming language um, to basically do all of the internal workings and such. Cool. Great. Um, yeah, I know that's a little subtle and maybe like a little bit over people's head and like maybe not necessary, but I think it's important to kind of just know there's a subtle, subtle difference between those two. Cool. All right. So let's move on then to our next section, which is data types. So I've already mentioned a little bit of like how things have different types um, and we can kind of talk about what these different types are. So there's a whole bunch of different ones. You can in fact define your own data types as well. Uh, we're not going to go into that today, but know that is possible. So these are not the only data types you will see in Python. You'll definitely see more um, as you go deeper and deeper into Python and all that good stuff. Um, but the main ones that we're going to talk about and main ones that you're going to use uh, most likely your day to day are string, integers, int, floats, float, booleans, bool, list, and dictionaries, okay? And so these basically are different types and it means that they can do certain things. Um, they have certain operations, they have certain you know abilities that you can do. For example, um, you can add uh, two lists together, um, strangely enough, but you can't really add an integer and a list together. So they're limited in the sense of like what they can do. However, note that um, in Python, you can actually add an integer in float together, that's actually a possibility. And in fact, you can do some interesting things. For example, even though a list plus an integer doesn't work, you can actually multiply a list with an integer um, and do some really interesting stuff with that. Um, so we're not gonna go through all those different subtleties. Uh, my suggestion is, you know, for fun in your spare time, like go ahead and try it's like, hmm, what if I do this? And at worst, it'll just give you an error. Um, you're, not gonna pro you're most likely not gonna break the computer. Um, you have to try pretty hard and uh, almost know what you're doing in the sense to break your computer. So uh, try things out, see how it works, and see what interesting things you can do. Okay. So let's talk about some of these uh, data types, though. So the first one is strings, and strings are very common because it's a lot of data uh, is just stored within a string. So basically, you can think of a string as like pieces of text. Um, you can think of like um, if people are more familiar with uh, programming languages, you can think of a string as um, a bunch of different characters strung together. So each character kind of strung together into an ultimate string here, okay? Um, you can use either single quotes or double quotes. So note that um, you can use single here and double quotes. Just know that it has to be consistent. So if I now put like a double quote in here, um, so for example, I run this guy, you see this is a string, this is also a string. If I put a double quote within here, uh, note that double quote would just come in there. So this can be kind of convenient to use if you want kind of, um, kind of quotes within your string it's easy enough to do that. However, if I want to do a single quote, note that this will give me an error because basically it says this is the string and doesn't know what, I don't know what this is right here, and it'll give me an error. So if I did want to include 
a nice little um, special uh, print, um, quote mark in there, I can actually to use a backslash here. And that basically says, hey, this is not going to be like a quote to say end the string. This is going to be a quote within the string itself. And so now if you print this out, you'll see that the little um, quote mark appears. Okay. So these are strings. Um, note again, like if you type this out, uh, you can see it's not in red here, which is kind of nice. Jupyter Notebook's kind of color coding for us. Um, this won't do anything. And at worst, you'll see an error. And I think um, as you get, you know, used to things, you get, um, you will never not see errors. You will always see errors throughout your whole career as data scientist programming. Uh, the real skill is to understand when an error is going through. And right here, it's not telling you like, oh, hey, like, that's not a string. It's just saying, hey, this I don't understand the syntax. I don't understand the grammar that you're trying to write here. Um, so it's trying to figure it out, but it really doesn't understand what's going on here. So that's the error it's giving. Okay. Cool. Any questions about the string so far? All right. So our next thing about strings um, are something called slicing. And we'll see slicing again in other data types too, but it's especially useful for a string. So basically um, a string is essentially like, a, you think of it like a list of different characters or kind of like a string of different characters. And we can actually pull out um, specific parts of the string. So if you remember what name looked like, I'm just gonna write name here so we can go ahead and see what that looks like. We have Prince, okay? If I wanted to get um, a certain character in there, I can actually put in the square brackets and we actually start counting with zero. So if I wanted the first letter of this string name, I can do name, square bracket, and then zero, and that will give me the first letter. If I want the second letter, note that I would just put one here, give me the second letter. If I wanted the third letter, I put two. So know that um, it does count from zero. So depending on, you know, if you're um, coming from programming language, you probably are familiar with counting from zero or starting to count from zero. Um, if not, it's maybe a little bit different um, to kind of adjust your mind in here. But um, this kind of allows us now to pull out specific parts of the string here. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, note that if I tried pulling out the 12th or the 13th character um, from this name, um, that doesn't exist. And in this case, it actually will give me an error saying, hey, it's out of range. Basically, the string doesn't go that far. So there's nothing to pull out. That's the 13th character. Okay. All right, um, we can also get kind of like a bunch of characters together. So in this case right here, this name here, the square bracket again, we have a number, but then we have a colon to four. And what this is going to do, it's going to get basically start first at the third character. Number two is going to be the third character. And it's going to grab the characters starting from here until it hits to this index here. So if I run this right here, you will see I N be printed out. And basically it's grabbing the third character i and then grabbing the rest of the characters until it hits the fifth character with the c so note that it doesn't include that last one that you have here um, but it'll grab all those characters in between um, i could have also done something like zero to the fifth character and that will grab me everything up to that fifth character so it should be p r i n and sure enough that's what i get here okay now, what's kind of nice is that um, Python kind of lets you, since you're doing slicing a lot of time where you might kind of slice up a string or other data object, um, you can actually say, well, instead of having zero, I meaning that's the front, you can actually just omit that and just have a colon and then to the end here. And that basically represents saying, hey, start at the beginning and go all the way to that fifth character. And so this will effectively be the same thing as having a zero here. Okay, does everyone see that? Okay, cool. Um, so any guesses then if I do something like, let's say a zero and then an empty part right here, has anyone got a guess what that might do? Would it just return everything? Yeah, it would basically go from the beginning and then return to the very end. So, yeah. So note now if I wanted to go from, let's say the third character to the end, I can just have three colon and then to leave it blank here and you can see here it'll go to the end here okay that's a very convenient way of grabbing um characters cool all right uh last kind of trick then is what if i do this um colon just a colon by itself what do we expect that to do does it return everything again 
Yeah, it returns everything, right? Basically from the beginning to the end. So it's kind of useful to kind of think about this being like, okay, like if there's nothing there, start at the beginning. If there's nothing at the end, start at the end, okay? And this will lead us to this guy. So I'm actually gonna make this a little bit simpler. So I'm gonna put a two here instead of a negative two. And so this might look kind of funky. You have two colons here and then a two. And what this is really saying is this part right here is essentially going from the beginning to the end, right? And this right here, this extra colon, is saying, how do you count it by? So normally, we basically would just count by one, saying, okay, give me the beginning, then the next one, the next one, the next one, the next one, until the end. Um, but in this case, it will actually go every other one. So you can see here, it will actually count P, and then skip over R, go to I, and then skip over N, go to C, and then it would end there because there's no other characters. So that's what that um, colon, colon, two means right here. Um, know that if you wanted the same thing as if return everything, uh, one would be the same thing where you basically just go every single one. You can also do something like, you know, three. And three would basically say, okay, go every third one. So we can see here, it skips over the R and I and returns the N and then doesn't return anything else after that. Okay. Cool. So these are kind so of like question, nice. Can you, yeah. mm -hmm. go ahead. Can, what if I just wanted, let's say the second one and the fifth one? Mm -hmm. So you wanted just the second letter like R and then the fifth one, which is C, right? Right, for example. Yeah, so in that case, like you can try, for example, let's say I want the, the second letter, which is one. <laughs> and then this is like, this seems a little more work than it needs to be. But um, if you wanted to try to really try that, it's like, okay, let me go ahead and get the fifth one, which was, we said C, right? So I can count by one, two, three. And there, that, that could be, how I can do that. So you might be asking, can I like say, I want just the second one and just the fifth one. And unfortunately um, with the base Python, that's not possible. Uh, you will see in Pandas um, and NumPy, you can actually specify a list of numbers, like grab me these specific ones. Um, in base Python without any extra um, bells and whistles, um, it's not really an easy thing to do. The simplest way essentially would just be grabbing the first one and then grabbing the fourth, or you said the fifth one. Oops. So that would be the closest thing probably. And then, for example, you could like add them together and that would get you kind of similar stuff. So this is where you kind of manipulate the strings and stuff like that and see how you can do things. All right. Thanks. Um, like, how do you do that? I'm sorry, um, I think Neil, and then I think Sean. Okay. Can't you do name one comma four with that one? Oh, so you're thinking like name one comma like this? Like that, Neil? Is that what you're asking, right? Okay, yeah, so you can see here, turns out not. Um, in Pandas, you can do something like this, and that will kind of like get you what um, essentially Christian was bringing up and you know what you kind of thought would make sense. Um, but in base Python, it wouldn't allow you. But you will see this kind of similar notation in NumPy and in Pandas, which is a separate library and kind of new functionality. Okay, great question. And yeah, you can see a little bit like, oh, it'd be really great if we could do that. And it turns out a lot of other people thought the same thing. So they added that functionality in. Okay, great, cool. Um, I'll just mention is that this guy right here, um, kind of same thing. It's like you basically get everything from beginning to end, and the negative basically just means count from the back. Um, from the back. So this will actually reverse the string now, basically saying from the beginning to end, but count backwards. So you can see I get the reverse string here, and now I can do something similar like minus two, basically count backwards from the my, um, from the back part right here. So it's going every other from the end. So it's a little funky, um, but this can be really useful. For example, just reversing a string over. Um, so you'll see this kind of notation very common with just the minus one. Okay, cool. All right. So um, other things we can't we can't do. So things like other things you can't do um, is you might, for example, want to reassign that uh, fourth character with some other character. But in this case, strings are actually what we call immutable means you can't actually change it. They're not able to be mutated I mean changed. So if I do this right here, I will actually get an error. Um, and you can see, I get this does not support, okay? Um, you can also, but to get this kind of functionality, you can do something like a dot replace. So for example, if I wanted to replace um, for my name, let's say, what was it? Let's say C and replace it with F, 
you can do this like this. But note this actually does not change name. This actually returns a new string. So if I actually check out name right now, you'll see that name does not change. And this is actually just saying, oh, from name, replace C with F, but give me a new string. So we're not actually changing the string here. We're actually reproducing a new string. So there's a little subtlety on that, but um, that usually is the thing that messes people up. But I could, for example, resign this to new name. And now this will give me um, a new name underneath here. Okay. But name will not be a changed. Sense. Cool. And I realize now, um, I think Sean did have a question earlier and I might have uh, skipped over Sean. So Sean, did you still have something you wanted to add in or ask? Yeah. Is this like truncate in SQL? What, what we were just going over? Oh, like um, some of these things right here? Yeah. Mm, I, I mean, I would say I, would, I wouldn't relate it to truncate. I might be some similar things. Um, I, I, I'm hesitant to say that just because the way SQL does it, it's differently. Um, this is much more of saying that um, in Python, this is going to get a little more like deep with like what Python's doing. Python, when you have a variable with a string, for example, it knows how long the thing is. And basically, no, um, again, getting more complicated, is that there's a pointer to each um, different character, and that creates the whole string itself. And so when we say, grab me the third one, it's actually like instantaneous in the sense of being like, oh, it just looks at the third position and just looks at what the value is supposed to be. And that's why, for example, if you do something like, you know, 10, it just goes, oh, I don't know, like, I can't do that because it doesn't even have to, um, it doesn't even have to like really look at what the value is. It just says, hey, is the string even long enough to do this and just stops. Um, but it might have similar functionality to trunc truncate sometimes. Did that answer your question? Okay. Yes. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, last thing you can do uh, for most of these functions, you can actually type the word help, and this will actually print out, you know, um, some information about that's kind of we call this the doc string about um, what this functionality is. Um, note that you can also in Jupyter Notebooks do a question mark string, and that will pop open a little um, section right here that you can also read here. So sometimes it's useful to do one of those if you want to know more information about that on the fly. But to be quite honest, I usually don't do that <laughs> unless I have um, kind of playing around with a new library. Usually what I'll do if I want some of my base functionality, I'll probably just go ahead and search it online uh, with whatever search engine I use. Okay. Cool. All right, so that is strings. Um, let's talk about integers and then we'll get into Booleans too. So integers and floats are our typical numerical values. I think. I won't spend too much time on it um, just because numericals, I think, are relatively something that people are <laughs> a little more familiar with. Uh, but there is a distinction between integers and floats, which, depending on your background, you might not have really thought too much about. But basically, integers are essentially like whole numbers, including the negative numbers um, in zero. And then we have floats, basically, where are basically all what we call like the rational numbers. Um, so all the ones that, well, I shouldn't say even notice rationals, but basically all the ones with decimal points. So you can see here, um, we can actually have different types. For example, we have type zero, or sorry, the value zero and say what that type is. Well, that's just gonna be an integer. Um, there's also a float, um, or you can make zero to be a float um, value by having this just decimal at the end here. And you can see this will actually point out now as a float. So by just adding that decimal in there, Python knows, oh, that is a floating point number. That is not a uh, integer anymore. So um, that can be useful where, we're using um, certain precision and stuff like that with data. Um, note that I could have also done 0, 0.0, and that would have still given me a float as well. Okay. Um, let's hear David says, I've seen type none. Why do we use this type? Oh, great question. So you might have type, so the value none is actually a reserved word in Python. And you can say that's none. You can see nothing gets printed out. And you might do type none. You can see it's actually a none type. Um, the reason why you might actually use none, which is not in this lecture, but useful to know, is basically representing saying there is nothing here, which is different from zero, which you think about that. Zero is saying there, the value is zero, but a none type is basically saying there is no data here. There's nothing to be had. Um, and that can be really useful, for example, if you are importing data in from some other source and you want to express that there is nothing here, um, but not zero. For example, let's say 
um, days old or, some, or the age of the person is on this data sheet. And you can have the zero technically, it's like, oh, age zero. Um, maybe you even have a negative number, if that makes sense in some contexts. But to say there's nothing there, you can use the word, or you can use the keyword none and say, oh, that is nothing. So that's why you might use none. Okay. Yes, so um, someone asked, or David asked, so is a null, can the type be redefined later? Um, yeah, so null is very similar to none. Um, technically speaking, Python doesn't have a null value, it's just a none type, which is a little bit different. And that's because um, the, the subtleties of Python start coming out if you're familiar with uh, other programming languages, is that null is technically a value, none is actually a type, which is kind of like has its own special type, and there's only one value for that type. Um, so it allows you to do certain things, but that type is kind of like set in stone, where it's like, oh, this is a none, um, this is a none type, or yeah. So if you do like x equals none, I can do like x like this, but I can then later on say, okay, well, let me just go ahead and do x equals like 10, and it perfectly fine to change it over. So hopefully that made sense, um, David. Cool. All right. Um, so I kind of can move it on then. Um, great questions, by the way. Um, you can also see again, this type float, floating point, see that. We can actually do arithmetic across two different types. Note that in Python 2, uh, which is now technically outdated, so you should not ever be using Python 2. Uh, but if you were to use Python 2, there were some extra subtleties with floating point. That's mostly been fixed with Python. So you can pretty much just go ahead and add these together, integers and floating. Uh, I will put a caveat is that um, computers can only be so precise with their decimals. Um, so there might come across some weird stuff too. Um, but you, for the most part, be able to just go ahead and um, use integers and floats together. Okay, and you can see here, for example, our integers do in fact come out, even though these are all integers, we actually do end up getting a floating point number. Okay, cool. Right, any questions at all? Great. Cool. So Hopefully, um, hopefully none of this feels very fast. Maybe it even feels a little slow, but it's worth kind of talking about these kind of basic stuff to make sure we understand how this all works, all right? Um, our next type is our Booleans, which are really quite easy um, because there's only two types. There's basically true and false. And Boolean um, basically is come from Boolean logic um, and basically allows us to say yes or, um, true or false, yes or no, uh, zero and one, they're binary. Um, in Python, we either have the capital true or we have capital false. So note that those are the two different values we can have. And that type can be uh, basically just a bool here. Uh, note that is different from other, like if you type in false, for example, here, this would in fact come out as a string, right? And this right here actually is not even um, a reserved word in Python. So this would give us an error. And you can see here, false is basically, it's looking for the variable false. Um, in some programming languages, you might see false as lowercase. Um, I'm looking at JavaScript right now, <laughs> like JavaScript will have lowercase false, um, but um, for Python, you actually use capitals for true and false. So for example, true would be the other value. And you can see that type is Boolean. Okay, cool. All right. Um, so just know that that basically are two different values here. These are really useful for conditionals, basically checking if something is true or false. And then if it's true, proceed to do something, or if it's false, proceed to do something, or if it's false, skip over this, or basically control different aspects of the flow. Um, check out our time here. I'm making some time. <laughs> All right. Uh, last thing we have is a casting for our different um, data types. And so we can actually change our data type into a new data type. So for example, we can change our integer into a string. We can change our integers into like floats. Or just take our floats and change them into integers. You can see here, we get a little bit of that flooring mechanism where basically it gets rid of the decimal. It doesn't care what the decimal is, just is whatever the whole number is, give me that. Um, we can also do, for example, some Booleans. This is actually a really interesting one because um, bool kind of comes out to what you might expect it to be. So a bool of zero is going to be false. Um, anything that is not zero ends up being true. And I believe even negative numbers will come out as true. So basically um, you can kind of do some interesting things of the casting. For example, I could do like none as a bool and that comes out as false. So you can actually see that we can actually kind of treat none a little bit like a false value. Um, I don't. I, I think you can do this as well. You can see kind of some play around with different values and kind of see what you can cast it to. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, any questions on any of the stuff we've talked about so far? Cool. 
you all have been pretty good at asking questions as we go through, so that's great. Um, all right, so now we're gonna talk about some basic data structures, particularly lists and dictionaries. And these are kind of like the two like main staples of Python for us to be able to um, kind of play around with and like kind of store information. Um, they can get very complicated, but we're gonna kind of start off with like what they represent. So the first one is a list. And if you're more familiar with um, like arrays from other programming languages, it's very similar. Uh, but lists are in a lot of ways even like uh, like really inherit a lot of the Python flexibility. Basically, a list is essentially just an ordered collection. So there is an order of thing, the first thing, the second thing, the third thing. Um, and basically, it can be whatever you want. Um, it can be any um, Python, any valid Python object in there. So you don't, for other programming languages, you might have to only do, you know, only integers, only floats, only strings. And here Python says, put whatever you want in it. I'll go ahead and store it. Um, for the record, it does tend to be slower th that for that reason. Um, and we'll see a little bit in NumPy and Pandas that um, you're restricted into not doing whatever you want. Um, it's basically for the speed efficiency, but this can be very useful if we want kind of a little more flexibility. So you can see here, all we have to do is say a random list, which is in this case, just going to be our variable name. I could have named it whatever I wanted to. This is the actual list right here. And we denote it with square brackets. And then the values are just separated by commas. Okay. And so now we can see, for example, if I go ahead and print out random list as well, you will see a random list. Okay. Um, one kind of nice thing about Python is that normally you can only write things on one line. If you have something with brackets, uh, you can actually write it on multiple lines. So sometimes you might see something like this where someone might write um, a list on like multiple lines like this. And that's okay because there are two brackets here. Um, note that I kind of separated it out this way, but you really could use whatever spacing you want as long as there's two brackets and then the values are separated by commas. All right. Uh, yeah. Some of that could be put in multi-line, inline comments. Um, yeah. It turns out Python's that's one thing Python does not do. Python does not have multiple in uh, multi-line comments. The only way to comment, if you remember, is with um, an octothorpe hashtag pound sign, whatever um, you like to call it. Um, there's no official name, it turns out. Um, but basically, that is how you make a comment. Unfortunately, there's no way to say, oh, have this comment span multiple lines. If you want multiple lines, you just have multiple signs. I like Octothorpe because it sounds ridiculous. Um, one thing you can do right here, which I kind of showed really subtly, um, is that if you have your cursor on this letter um, in Jupyter Notebook, if I hit um, in my computer, it's control, but um, if you're using a Mac command, and then the uh, forward slash, so the one that looks like the one that looks like this, is it forward slash? If I do that, you can actually comment and uncomment things very quickly. And in fact, you can actually highlight a whole bunch and comment and uncomment multiple sections at once, which is really useful when you're kind of playing around and testing things out. Okay. Cool. I got a question regarding your formatting. So I was reading the PEP8 file from mm -hmm. last week, and it was telling us to not use tab. Now, according to my research, I could do it, change it. So tab uh, equals four. Mm -hmm. What's your method for responding to? Yeah, great question. So if you were paying close attention, you might notice that I was uh, tabbing. But I will tell you right now is that I have the setting where it looks like, like it looks like a tab. It's actually four spaces. Like there's actually four different spaces in here. So my feeling is I love using tab because it makes my life easier. Can I do indent, indent, indent? Especially because Python is particularly um, finicky about like it's relaxed about everything except indents. It's like it has to be exactly four spaces or a tab. Um, so what I just do is I just basically convert all my tabs into spaces, um, which is what you're seeing here. So it makes my life a little bit easier. And um, yeah, I don't think there's any reason to have a tab in like your actual code. Um, I think spaces are perfectly good. Cool. Does that answer your question? Um, I think it was Sean. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, but the, the person that they said you should change tab size to equals four, you don't think that's a good idea? Um, I believe. Um, Oh, you're saying like using tab size four versus tab size two? Yes. Yeah, I I, I never use tabs, so I just change um, my literal key where I hit the word, the tab um, on my keyboard, literally just oh. inserts four spaces. Um, okay. Yeah, and I think that's 
that's perfectly good. I would, um, the other option, right, is to change tabs to two spaces. So that means that if it's an actual tab character on your code, it would show up as two spaces versus four. I, I kind of like that better because it helps me identify very quickly if it was a tab or not. Um, but effective coding, it probably would make sense to have four. Um, and this is where, you know, pep eight's a really great, like, standard of like, you know, start here. Um, but every business, every coding um, documentation, it's going to have slight deviations from that pep eight. So um, I don't think of it as the Bible. I think of it more of a guideline of what you can do versus the ultimate truth. Okay. Great. Good question. Um, I like these random questions, like not this random or not useful, Sean, um, but they're definitely like something useful that to talk about later on, or like, you know, that might come up later on. Cool. All right. Um, going back to the list though, now that I just kind of showed you some fun stuff, uh, you can slice them just like strings. So uh, basically just know each character or each, instead of each character, we have each element in the string. So for example, I get the, the second element to the very end, I get Alan 8.5 and true. Since those are the basically um, everything after the first element. Okay. All right. Um, we can also have different um, lists together here. So you know that I have two different lists here. I have this list, which is one Allen 8.5 true. If I switch these around, these are not the same thing because the order does in fact matter. Um, I believe if I do this, so this should be in the same order, this will give true, but note that this will only give true if these values are exactly the same. Um, if for example, I had, let's say 8.0 here and I had eight, that will try to say, are these actually equal to each other? In this case, it turns out, if you really want to know, is eight equals 8.0. And that actually ends up being true. So know that basically when you do this um, double equals, that's basically not an assignment of saying, hey, are these actually equal to each other? Um, and note that basically what it'll do is look at the first element and with the first element of the second list, the second element of the first list, the second element of the second list and so on and check that each one of those things will evaluate to true and then if they're all true then the whole thing is true right here okay cool um great uh some other things to note is that lists are mutable so we can actually change things in the list without re um, actually redefining the whole thing so for example we couldn't do this in a string but in this case we can say random list take the third element and change that to 85 and that will actually change that element now to, in this case, a string of 85, where originally it was, um, I believe it was eight. Um, so you can see is that we can actually do reassignment. They are mutable, they can be mutated, okay? Um, some other things that you might find useful, this, for example, will give us the index of 85. This tells us, okay, this is giving us, it's saying it's the second um, index, meaning the third element, zero, one, two. And that's basically saying where it is in the list. Um, you can also add on to the list by doing dot append. So this we will add to the list that's currently here and do a dot append to 85. And note that does in fact change the random list here. So we don't have to reassign it, for example, like we'd have to do with strings since they're mutable, they actually will change. So we do just dot append here. Um, you can also remove items, for example, like remove Allen, and you can see here, that will actually remove it. Um, if I do dot remove 85 here, you can see it actually just removes the very first occurrence of it, it doesn't keep removing it. Um, there's actually an option to remove um, if I wanted to. Um, so I wanted to see if I can add another one, 85. There we go. So you have two 85s here. If I remove all 85s, uh, there is an option to do that. So one thing you can do is check out the, do the documentation um, of this thing, and you can actually see some documentation of like how to do this. Um, and it can tell you a little bit of like saying, oh, it removes the first occurrence. So the way to bring this up, um, kind of show you real quickly, is that if I put my cursor within the bracket, and I do a shift tab, that actually pulls up the little doc string, which can be like a little hint to be like, hey, like, is this do what I expect it to do? So you can kind of check a little bit of how these things function. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, all right. Some other things you might want to look, we can also create list of stuff. So for example, if I just want a list of like one, two, like zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, um, that'd be super convenient. Um, one way we can do that is actually using this function called range. And range eight basically is a special function where it says, all right, it's kind of lazy, essentially. Like essentially it's literally lazy where it basically it won't figure out this directly. 
and will basically will wait until you ask it to do something to bring up these values. But this range value basically says go from zero and go on all the way until you hit eight and stop at eight. So basically this allows me to have this range, but if I want it into a list, so I can kind of operate it, you can actually create this list like casting. And that will create now a list that we have here. And now we can actually see, for example, the length of Bob is just eight elements here. So len is the length right here. Note that it's actually a function versus um, property or something like that. So you do have to use len like this versus like a dot len, which I think sometimes can be confusing if you come from a different programming language. Um, and you can see again, some other things. This is a more advanced range here. Um, if I'm actually in this range here, if I do shift tab, you can see what this means basically is that this is the starting part right here. This is the stopping and this is how you step basically how you count across. So it's basically we'll start at two, count by twos all the way until right before it hits 10. So we'll see it stop at eight, two, four, six, eight. Okay. Cool. Any questions on that? Cool. All right. And for the record, like there's a whole lot of just things I showed you for lists and stuff. Um, do you have to memorize this, all of this right now? Absolutely not. You will find what things you use commonly um, what things are used most frequently, and you'll learn those first. And then as you over time, you'll see use cases for other things. Okay. And if you never know, like, how do I check the length of a string or of a, like a list? It's literally just Google, you know, or whatever search engine you use, you know, the length of a, a list in Python, and usually it'll show up exactly how to do that. Okay. Cool. All right. This brings us to um, our next data structure here, dictionaries. So dictionaries is a little more advanced, but um, basically the idea here is that we have a, still a collection, but it's an unordered collection. So there's no order, technically speaking, in a dictionary. Um, and it's actually using a pair of elements. So uh, you can kind of think of it like an, an English dictionary or an American dictionary or whatever, right? Is that you have your word and then your definition. So you can kind of think of these like first elements in there as being keys. And then those second elements are called values. So essentially we have a key value pair. So you'll hear that kind of phrase used quite a lot, key value pair. Um, and that essentially allows us to talk about dictionaries as being, we have this key, and then that points to this value. Um, this is kind of similar to a list. And in the sense that we have these different values, the key is just the position. So like, oh, the key zero points to this value, the first element in the list. The key one points to the second element in the list and so on. Dictionaries just allow you to use um, any kind of key as long as that key is immutable. So as long as that key doesn't, it can't ch be changed, um, we can always use it as a key. That can be strings, those can be numbers, um, they can even be um, other funky weird stuff in Python that you want to be your key. Okay. Um, so uh, here's an example here that uh, Greg had made. Um, so this is a dictionary called Greg. We denote it with little curly braces like this. And you can see here, I'm gonna actually make some new lines so you can see a little better, is that this right here is the first like element in the dictionary. And I shouldn't say first because it's unordered, but you can see here the key here is name, a string name, colon, and that says, okay, the next thing about to happen is the value. So let's say the name is the key, the value is Greg, and then a comma saying, all right, give me the next um, key value pair. So next key value is, key or occupation is that key, data scientist is that value, and so on and so forth. So you can basically keep going all the way through different keys and values. And note that they don't all have to be the same. For example, HP is still a string, but the value is, in this case, uh, just, um, an integer. Okay. Cool. Any questions about this? What, why would you use a dictionary? Yeah, great question. Um, so one basically um, is the flexibility, is that a list kind of requires you to have an order. Um, a dictionary allows you to kind of use things like out of order and specifically refer to the thing by some kind of key. For example, if I wanted to have some structure of saying, um, you can think of this being like, you know, this object, you know, this dictionary being called Greg, and I want different attributes of Greg in this case, you know, what is um, Greg's occupation? Well, Greg's occupation is data scientist. I could technically make the same exact thing in a list, right? I could put Greg is the first thing, data science, uh, the occupation is the second thing, HP the third thing, but then I'd have to memorize exactly where each thing belonged, where a dictionary allows me to say, hey, 
just give me what is occupation of this dictionary. And so for example, um, so we'll see this in a second, but I'll show, I guess I'll show you all right now. If I wanted to get the occupation from Greg, the Greg dictionary, um, I can use these curly braces. And remember kind of similar to how, like if we had a list, we'd put like zero or one or two, something like that. We can put in the key here. So that would be like, for example, let's say occupation. Okay. And that will give me the value for occupation to the scientists. But let's say, for example, I have another dictionary. Let's call it Victor. And I'm just going to just a couple things on here. Let's say my occupation is, I don't know, dad. Okay. So that's my occupation here. And now I have two different dictionaries. I can just go ahead and change out what dictionary I have here and just say, oh, give me the occupation for Victor. And now I can get that specific one. So that kind of allows me to have a little more flexibility in, um, what's it called? Asking for, you know, what value I want from it. Yeah. Can you, can you link? If you were to create those two dictionaries, can you link them based on a key, a bit like a primary key in SQL or something? Ooh, interesting. Um, you definitely could kind of refer to those things. So for example, let's say I look at HP like this, 140, and then like I can look at Greg's you know, HP um, and maybe kind of like combine those in there. Uh, unfortunately, dictionary doesn't have um, that built in, like being like, oh, like do a dot join if you're familiar with SQL and stuff like that. Um, but you could create code that works very similar to something like that, where you could say, all right, if these two are equal, if if Victor's and Greg's um, HP values are the same, do this. So this would come out as true and say, okay, go ahead and do something now. Um, and so we could actually use that to control things. Yeah. Cool. Great right, questions. Um, all right. And I see David asked a question, would we read a table with it or is it always a set of paired values? Um, so it's always a set of pair valued, but your pair values, the value can be whatever you want it to be, any valid Python object. So um, I might bend people's mind here for a second, but just bear with me. Let's just say, um, let's say, let's say we look at Greg's coworkers, let's say coworker, and that value should be me, Victor, right? Because I am Greg's coworker. So I can, for example, put in the variable Victor, and Victor represents whole dictionary. So you can have something like Greg's coworker. And you can see that's actually a whole dictionary that is mine. So I could have even like, if I wanted to be like super messy, I could have done this, which is a little hard to read, but also the benefit of having Victor as the variable, I can change Victor now and say, Oh, well, Victor wants to go by, you know, uh, my full my full name is Victor Lauren. So that's actually like my full name. It's like, well, now I just run this guy here. And you can see, oops, I actually have to run this guy again. You can see that Victor Lauren comes out here. So it actually allows me to kind of be a little more flexible in like how I do things. So again, is this something you need to do like all the time? It's like, well, sometimes you just find different use cases for why you might do this. Um, David asked, could the value be a list? Absolutely. This could be, you know, and you can see that will come out as a list now, right? So you, hopefully now you're kind of seeing a little bit like how flexible it is and some could be multidimensional. Um, so that would be kind of like a nested list within a list. So you can kind of see something like this where now we have a list within a list, you know, or a dictionary within a dictionary within a dictionary. You could definitely go down that rabbit hole um, as far down as you really want to. Um, but yeah, that's what kind of the power here is. The only thing you cannot do, um, again, is have a key here that is in, uh, that is mutable. So note, for example, if I make a list here, let's say x equals three, I could have three right here, and that would be fine. So I'm just showing you that you could put in different keys in here. And you can see I that three. However, oh, I should put x, sorry. That's what I meant to do. There you go. So we can see x is representing three there. But if I have a list, like something like this, you can't do this because basically it's saying that list can change. Um, so it can't actually use that in a dictionary. And you might see there's unhashable type. Um, this actually gives you a cue a little bit of like what a dictionary is representing is actually equivalent to a hash map. If anyone's familiar with hash map from other programming languages. Um, but basically it just means that you can't deter, you can't make sure that's going to be the same value every single time because that list now can change. Um, and so we don't want that to happen. So that's why this key, for example, um, has to be um, 
mute, um, immutable. Okay. Cool. Great. All great questions. Hopefully you're all seeing a little bit of the power, even if it's not completely like saying, oh, I can do all these different things. You're kind of see a little bit what that flexibility is and you play around with it and see, you know, what makes sense and what works out. Okay. Cool. Um, going back to Greg, though, I'm going to make this a little simpler with, again, getting rid of that guy, just going back to our typical Greg. You can see Greg back there. We can get just the keys with dot keys. This will give us everything that is a key. So it should be his name, occupation, HP, favorite color, weakness. Note that it technically does not have an order, so you can't rely on saying that this is going to be a certain like order. It just happens to be in the order that we have it in here, um, but you really shouldn't rely on that. But this can give us all the keys. Note that it looks like a list, but it's actually technically a dictionary keys. It's a special variable type. So if I actually do like type, oops, type, you can see here it's actually typed dict keys, but it'll work very effectively like a list. Um, so just kind of know it's very similar to that. Um, we can also get all the values. In that case, it would just be just the values without the keys. And we can do that. And sometimes that can be very useful. Okay. And then we can get this thing called dot items. And dot items basically returns each item is going to be the key value pair. And we represent that with these little guys right here. So the first value, for example, is if I just get the first value. Oops, I forgot. It's not, <laughs> it's not a list, so I can't do that. Um, but you can see the first value here is the key comma the value. Same thing all the way through, the key comma the value. So this can be very useful when you want to um, iteratively go through the dictionary and see what values and what basically with keys and values paired up together. Okay, cool. Um, any questions at all? Um, like I mentioned, you can actually grab the specific, you know, key with this um, bracket notation right here. Um, note that, like we saw, we can actually, since dictionaries are, the values can be changed. Dictionaries are mutable. They just have to have the keys immutable. We can actually change the values in here. So for example, I can change the occupation for Greg to be wizard or whatever it is I want. And note now, if I look at Greg completely, you'll see that his occupation will in fact stay wizard. Okay. Um, as you can see a little bit, you can also add new um, keys in this way. So to add a new key to a dictionary, you essentially just pretend like it's in the dictionary already and say, okay, uh, the key nationality will point to USA. So this will be the key, this will be the value. And if we then check out Greg, you will see that this will be updated here. Okay. Um, no, the thing you might be asking now is like, well, what happens if we grab a key that doesn't exist? So like, you know, let's say, um, just grabbing a oh, key here that doesn't exist, you'll get an error saying key error, saying, hey, that doesn't exist in the dictionary, so we can't do anything. But if I now assign it to a value, it says, oh, okay, I don't have that in the dictionary yet, but I can add this as a new value. And that will now, you can see here, that appears. Um, note that this guy right here, uh, note Joel is equal to this empty dictionary. This is what we call an empty dictionary. So notice the dictionary, just nothing in it. It's still a dictionary. Um, you can still do stuff in it. In fact, what you might now do is actually add things to, if I do, um, I can't <laughs> have a key on there. <laughs> That's one of our other instructors, Joel. Um, so Joel here, if I now say, okay, I want to add something to the dictionary, I can say, you know, like, um, let's say occupation is equal to, um, instructor. You can see now they have in there. So this is a nice way you can create an empty dictionary and then add to it later on as you want to. Cool. All right. So we're good. Any questions at all? Um, let's hear it. Question, is an empty dictionary like an empty set? Does the dictionary concept correspond to set theory? Oh, that's actually really interesting. Um, you can't, there actually are sets in Python um, that actually correspond directly to set theory, if you're curious about that. Um, dictionaries don't quite um, inherit everything that you would need for set a complete for for complete set theory, um, but there are actually objects called sets um, in um, what's it called in a uh, Python that would correspond to set theory if that's something that you're looking for. Um, 
they're used a little less frequently for data structures and stuff, but they can be useful in certain um, situations. But dictionaries, because you you don't have an order which is similar to sets, the key value part is the weird part. Um, so you can have multiple values, but with different keys. Um, so, or sorry, you should have the same copy of a value, but with different keys. So that kind of changes out like why you can't use set theory or why you can't use it to recreate set theory, if that makes sense. So, cool. All right, um, free question. Uh, I'll kind of, I like mentioned already, we can look a little more dictionary and methods. These are just repeating the same stuff, but what we're now can do is actually use these keys and values to iterate on it. And this will actually show us a little bit of control flow. There's actually a for loop here. And this, for example, is our dictionary here. We can, for example, iterate on um, these keys. So I know we haven't seen for loops in yet, but, but we'll see in a second. And basically what this will say, hey, zoo.keys will give us, if I look at this right here, zoo.keys, that will give us basically giraffe weight, elephant weight, monkey weight. And so this for loop right here, right here, so 4k in zoo.keys, this will allow us to print out that key each time. You can see here, each key now is now printed out. Um, you can do something similar with zoo.values. No, that's just going to be the values themselves. So they'll print out each value. And then you can do the same thing for an item in each zoo.items here. And you can see here, this print item is going to print out these pairs. So note that this right here is uh, draft set, draft weight 1800. So these are all the key value pairs. Okay. So we'll see more for loops, but I just wanted to demonstrate really quickly, like what that looks like with keys and values and stuff like that and how you might typically use this. All right. Great, cool. Um, all right, I know we're kind of close to like what I said with time with like, um, <laughs> we're gonna finish at like the 30 marks. So we've got technically eight minutes left, um, but let's see, we have the next part is control flow. I wanted to kind of gauge, are we okay if we go maybe a little bit longer and then we'll just kind of take a break a little bit later. Does that sound good to everyone? Okay, I know it's kind of long. <laughs> I'm going through a lecture for you know hour fifteen can be a little long, but um, we'll we'll go through this part and then we'll have a good decent break. Okay, cool. So our last part is control flow. So control flow basically allows us to flow uh, control the flow of the program. So right now, basically, when we run something like a cell here, it basically just executes everything from the top to the bottom, right? And basically, everything I've written there is just going to keep going all the way through. Uh, what you saw right here allows us to not just run just one time. This actually allowed us to go over again and again. We did multiple prints over and over and over again. So that's kind of one example of control. Um, one thing I kind of mentioned is talking about using true and false to direct saying, do we move forward, do we not move forward, or do this or don't do this. And that's where we get these if statements and conditionals, we call them. So an if statement, and if you're familiar with other programming languages, you most likely have seen if statements at some point um, in your programming. But um, they are built into Python and they're very powerful, basically it allows us to control the logic of the program. So basically what that if does is we put an if statement and it just says if whatever over to the right here is true, then do this indented part. So for example, what this will do is num76, right? This will check, okay, we'll see what num um, modulo four is, well, that's zero. And basically this part right here is saying, okay, is num modulo four equal to zero? And we know that's true, right? And we can see that will print out true. So what this does now is like, okay, if this is true, colon, do this indented part. Okay, everyone see that? So we'll see here, because this is true, this will go ahead and print yes, right? If, uh, let's say I change this down to 75, we'll see that this actually is false, right? Well, since this is false now, this won't print out. So it will basically completely skip over this block. And you can see here, nothing gets printed out now because this whole thing is false. Okay. This is kind of equivalent. You could kind of imagine replacing this with some variable like, like x. And x is equal to this thing. And that's kind of like how it executes that. And so you can kind of imagine x is just it eventually just ends up either being true or it's false. Basically, there's no um, other option it can be. So if I now have like, for example, if false, not false, or not true, um, if true, 
this will print out. Okay, so that's essentially what's going on right here when we have this part of the statement. Okay. Does that make sense, people? Okay. Cool. Any questions? Okay. So again, just reiterating because it's an important part is that basically you have an if part and then you have the statement, which is whatever this is right here. You finish it off with a colon to say, okay, like if this is evaluates to true, then do everything indented here. Okay. And note that we could actually have multiple parts indented, for example, like this. Um, note that it's going to evaluate to false. So I'm just going to, there we go. So you can see it can do multiple parts right here. And so you can do different changes and stuff like this. And this allows you not to have more control over your program. Okay. Cool. Um, to have even more control, we can do an else statement. So um, with an if statement, we say, well, okay, if this is true, execute the code that's underneath here. But if it's not true, we can add in an else statement, which is optional. You can see here, it does not appear over here. So we can actually add if we want to. And this else basically says, hey, if this, if none of this was true and you skipped over it, now do this guy, okay? So since this is false here, this will actually print out no. Basically saying, hey, is this true? And it turns out this is not true. So it skips over this part and then goes to else. Like, okay, well, let me go execute this part. Um, note that if this was in fact true, so if this is true, it'll say, oh, this is true, print out yes, and then we'll completely skip over else, won't do else anymore. Okay, so you can see, it goes like that. Cool. All right. Um, you can see we can also have an in-between part called elif, um, kind of like else if. So note that in uh, Python is a specific um, uh, notation of that you have to use elif to basically saying, all right, if you want to do an if and then say, well, let me check a different condition now before going to else, you have to do elif, not else if or whatever it is. So it's a special key or a special um, reserved word. So basically what will happen here is, is all right, it'll check is number divisible by three and it'll print a multiple of three if that's true. If it's not true, it'll go down to the next block for elif and says, okay, if that is not true, then check if this is true. Okay, and then if this isn't true, and this isn't true, then do else, okay? And then we can have that. So you can see here, we have, it'll actually stop right here. But if I added, for example, 68, you can see here, it is a multiple of three. If I have here, it is one more than a multiple of three. Which doesn't seem to make sense, but, oh, that's right, okay. So that's the idea here, is that we can essentially have um, these different print statements be controlled um, by saying if this is true, if it's not true, if it's this true, if it's true, and so on. Okay. Um, note that you can have more LF statements. So, for example, I could do something like try to there we go. LF um, number is greater than one hundred. So note that this right here. If I do this. You see it still prints out right here, but if I add one more, it would normally go right here, like we saw before, but since this is a big number, it'll stop right here and say, oh, like that's a big number, and it'll just print out and skip the rest of everything else. Okay. This is kind of like how you can control a little bit of like what you want to actually do. And again, you can have multiple lines here, like you know, print, I don't know, num. You can do other things like num. Uh, equals num plus one. So you can do more control and more complex things by doing this part here. So you can kind of see a little bit what it does. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, any questions on that? Okay. Cool. All right. So our last thing, um, and then we'll take a break, is our for loops. So we kind of saw a little peek of a for loop already. Um, but a for loop basically is a way to kind of repeat a task over and over automatically. So um, an example of this basically is printing out every number that comes up. So for example, uh, if I wanted to print the numbers between one and seven, right, including seven, I can do something for val, um, this is just a variable name, a temporary variable name, um, in, and then this guy here is my kind of like my thing to iterate over. So this will print out one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, on each new line. And so what essentially happens here is that uh, when you execute this cell, it'll go say for this temporary variable, 
in this kind of like what we call an iterator. So this is kind of like something you can iterate on top of basically that has like multiple things in it, a collection. Um, it'll pull out the first thing and say, okay, first thing, val is going to be whatever the first thing is in this case, it's the number one. And then it's like, okay, go ahead and execute any code that's indented. And so it says print, you know, val. Well, val is just the first thing, which is just the number one. And it says, all right, cool. You enter the end here, go back to the top for val. Is there another thing in our iterable? Oh yeah, there's a second thing in here. This is the second thing for val, prints that part and repeats, 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 repeats all the way through. So you can imagine these two lines of code are really kind of just like going through over and over and over again, like in a cycle. Okay, until it hits finally the last thing. It's like, hey, is there anything else in this uh, range? And you say, nope, there's nothing left. And so then it stops. Okay. Um, a kind of equivalent to this, a little bit shorter, would be something like one, two, three. This right here is an iterable. Basically, it means it has some kind of iteration you can have. So the first thing is going to grab the first element, the second element, and then the third element, and then stop. And so this will print out one, two, three. Victor, what is your temporary variable called val? Can you call it anything? You can put anything you want. So I can put anything, right? So, and this is a temporary variable that will only exist for that for loop. So that allows me to do whatever I want. Um, note that I didn't have to use the word anything. I could, you know, just, it's the most interesting thing, but I could put like, do that however many times. Um, but note that if I try now doing, if I do something like, you know, high here that will execute the very end. If I try doing that temporary variable here, because it was temporary just for that loop, it will actually give me an error saying, hey, oh, I guess in anything actually, I might have defined this in a different way. Hmm. Did not expect that to be quite honest. Um, so I'm not quite sure about it. learn something new today. Um, but normally you wouldn't have this. That's weird. Hmm. But I guess anything is defining the yeah. list one, one, two, three. Yeah. It so anything would be three because it's got three values in it. Yes, that, that's exactly what's happening. And honestly, this surprised me. This might be um, something I learned back in Python too that kept in my mind that I thought was true. And apparently it's not. So um, I have something to do after this lecture to kind of explore a little bit. Um, but there's some weird stuff that you can do with for loops and stuff. But in general, you can think of this generally like a temporary variable. Um, sorry, I'm a little shook up from that because I realized I didn't know that. Um, if you did want it to be temporary, like I don't really care about using, like for example, you just want to print out yes three times. A safer thing to do is actually not using a variable name. And so you'll see something, for example, just for underscore in this list. And basically that means that underscore doesn't exist. There's basically, there's no reference to this variable. It says, oh, for blank, it's simply using like for blank in this, basically you're saying, I don't really care what the number is. Just do this every time you pull out an iterator. So this will still print out three times, it's confusing, but you can see here. So this is what you'll typically see in some people's code. For example, you see this little underscore basically just saying, oh, I don't care what the value is. I just want to iterate this many times. And what's the, what's the standard to put in there? Is there a standard syntax? Um, not really. I'd like to say like what you might see is I or J and that comes from very classical programming. However, I will say use what's the most relevant and makes the most sense for the situation. So for example, if you want to pull out, um, let's say each thing that you're going to pull out is going to be, I don't know, a different occupation. So for example, this could, for example, be, you know, let's say, um, data scientists. And let's say that third thing is um, instructor. Okay, this will basically print out the occupation each time. And so this is a little more like explained like what's going on, but you could technically put like I in here and that would be fine. But you can see that occupation, that name of the variable makes the code a little more explainable when you first look at it saying, oh, I know what this is representing. Cool, good question. And then I think David, you had a question too. Yeah, I thought the, the underscore, isn't that, doesn't that retain the last, the value of the last calculation? Yeah, so you're saying um, this guy right here, I actually wonder, I've never done this, usually. I just, wonder if that's why you put your, um, your anything. Yeah, technically speaking, like, Python is very flexible, so like, apparently, that is actually, like, like, we'll keep the variable, but convention usually means if you have this underscore, is kind of like saying, I don't care what this is, you're telling the pr person reading the code saying, I'm not going to use this value. It's just something for me to like okay. keep track of. 
Okay. That's nice. No problem. Yeah. Uh, for the record, you should never do this. Um, this people will look at your code and go like, "What is going on?" Um, so don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Out of all my years of using Python, I realize it's almost on ten years now. I've never seen anyone ever do that. So don't be the first. Um, <laughs> okay. Cool. All right. Um, so that's a for loop. So now what you can do is have a little bit of control. There's some more advanced stuff you can do with for loops and play around with it. Um, but we're not going to talk about right, that right now. But um, one big powerful thing you can do is actually combine it with for loops in if statements. So we can actually see here, for example, we have that for val. Remember that for val, uh, this guy right here. I'm just going to do that real quick so we can remember what that printed out. We'll print out uh, one through seven, right? And so what this will happen, this val basically says, hey, um, take out a value for each time. So the first value, the second value, the third value, and iterate over and over again. If that value is greater than or equal to four, then print out val. So now we have a little more control. Now we're iterating over, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, but only printing it out if it's greater than or equal to four. So this again controls a little bit of what we want to do. Um, note we can make this even more complicated, where we have like something like else, where if it's not greater than four, it's saying print um, too small. And you can see here now we have a little more control. So it is in fact going over through each value, but it's not quite, um, what's it called? It's not quite uh, um, like you're controlling what's gonna happen in this actual code within here, okay? And this is where you can get things like nested for loops, like for loops within for loops and doing all these crazy different things. Um, but you can kind of hopefully see the power that we have now in here. Okay. Um, last one, like you kind of showed, we can get like all the keys, for example, and this one right here basically is checking, hey, if that key is a string variable, I'll go ahead and print out the key and then Greg key, which basically will get the value from that Greg dictionary. So remember, this is Greg here. So this is our Greg guy right here. And I'm actually, uh, well, that's fine. We'll keep it this way. So basically this will check if this type is equal to string. Let's say, okay, we'll just do it that way. Um, this will print out every single time, but you can see here now we have some control of getting, you know, using that key and then getting that value with Greg key. So you can do more complex processes here. Um, I could have done maybe something like if uh, Greg key, that first letter, right? So basically that uh, this keys are all strings, getting the first letter, if that's equal to letter W, you know, then print this out. So that will only print out um, weakness here. Oh, I guess I have an integer somewhere. Oh, wait. Sorry, I misread this. That's why I realized that this 140 is key right here. I meant to go more like if the first letter of the key is um, the first letter of the key is W, then print that out. And you can see that would happen here. And it looks like I might have some funkiness here. So you didn't have to play around with this. I'm just playing this on the fly. So I'd have to be a little more careful. I'm actually not quite sure what's going on here, but that's okay. okay. So, um, yeah, that's weird. Sorry, I'm kind of in my own head right now. Oh, it's because this is a, this is an integer right here in some cases. So you can do some extra stuff, for example, Let's say I have an if statement. <laughs> Hopefully I'm not losing anyone here, but an if statement within an if statement. I can do like if type Greg key equals um, string. So that's checking that the actual value will be a string. And then I can go and print this out. And that should hopefully get me what I wanted. Apparently not. Something's going on here. Some of the keys or values are not coming out the way I expect it to. Oh, there you go. Get some live coding to see how I can mess things up. <laughs> so you can see here a little bit is I had the parentheses right here, which if you were to print this out, this actually just ends up being a type. What type would this be? Not knowing any of the values or anything like that. What is this? What would that execute to? Mm -hmm. String wouldn't be a string. It actually, would execute to a boolean because yeah. this guy right here 
Again, like what is this value? I don't know, but whatever this value is, let's say for example, it's some valid syntax. This will come out as false or true. So the type of that would always be Boolean, which <laughs> the funny thing is like, what is this execute? So like it turns out that actually ends up executing as true. This is true. <laughs> Funnily enough. So you can see Python's very flexible, which can make it kind of challenging sometimes to figure out what's going on. So cool. All right. Um, I know we're t definitely 10 minutes over. Um, I'll just kind of mention these two last ones. We kind of seen a little bit, but basically a little bit more complex stuff here where essentially we build up you know, an empty list here and add things to the list if, you know, as we iterate over these different letters here, um, if there are vowels in here, it'll actually append over to this original um, empty list. And you can see at the end here, we get a list now of all the vowels. So you can kind of see a little bit what's going on here. So for example, if I had like just name Victor, it'll iterate over V and then I and C and then T and then O and R. And it'll just put, give me just the vowels of my name. Okay, or if I had something like Sequoia, that's wrong, but it doesn't matter. It's a word. All right. You can see it get all the vowels from here. Okay. Um, that's going to bother. There you go. <laughs> um, and then you can also do some stuff with dictionaries as well, kind of building up the dictionary. So for example, this dictionary now gets built up by iterating over a range from zero through zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then basically say doubles of that number is equal to just two times that number. So we now have a dictionary at the end here that will basically give us our doubles. So I could later on use this now to say, what's the doubles? Uh, what's the double of um, six? And that'll give me 12. So you can see a little bit of how you can use this kind of functionality to build up more complex um, ideas and stuff. Cool. All right. Well, um, any questions at this point right now? Um, I know we're a little bit over. Um, so I want to give you guys a good break, but before we go into break, are there any kind of like burning questions or comments that um, you might have? No, pretty good. All right. Yeah, I'm gonna so I'm gonna stop the recording here. I'll, I'll at least pause it.